Welcome. Christ is risen. He's risen indeed. Amen. One more time. Christ is risen. He's risen. Amen. We welcome you here this morning on this Easter morning here in the sanctuary. Got a Facebook Live. Some of you I know will be watching later. We're really glad that you are here. It's nice to know we have a fellowship that can't be separated by death because we're all going to be for a time in that transition. We also have times in transition between knowing God and loving us and with us and fulfilling our lives, filling us with the Spirit, and times when we feel like God is not present. So Easter is a day where we get to affirm both, and we are loved and forgiven, and Christ is present with us, and we face our mortality with immortality right there with us. So I welcome you in the name of Christ, and I hope that you'll prepare here and there at home to have bread and cup so that we can share in, the, in communion this day, so that we can be the body of Christ, the body of the risen Lord, together as we share the bread. Let's share a welcome this morning. Welcome, all who are here. Welcome. Love you guys. Welcome, my physical, mental, and spiritual self to this moment. Welcome. Welcome, spirit of the risen Christ among us. Welcome. Together, we willingly enter communion one with another. Welcome.
Lord, we come here on this day, remembering your disciples who wondered for a couple of nights if you would still be around. The vision they had caught on to and bought into and entered into in their lives would be true or not. They had times when they were confused about how your kingdom would come on earth. They had times when they wondered the marvelous things Jesus did said. They really weren't that sure they needed to know the truth. So we get together on this day and celebrate that first time when they began to realize that it was true. The love that was so huge and magnificent and always forgiving that Jesus played and told about was true. And that that love and power that transforms lives and that the hope that your kingdom would come on earth as it is in heaven was now a hope empowered by a life and a power beyond what they understood until the resurrection. So on this Easter, we invite you to come and fill us with your Holy Spirit and raise us from life we have been living, life we have for us. Help us become the people who embody and bring about the reality of the prayer that Jesus taught us by the prayer to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we give those who trespass against us, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the by Jesus and our glory. Brianna is going to take you back to your class. Come on. Come on, you. Come here. I got a story. <laughs> there was a there was a family reunion. Have any of y'all ever been to a family reunion? A big party where all the people there are some way or another related. Pretty cool. We used to go to family reunions in Donald, Arkansas, and Arkansas, Arkansas, and Old Missouri, different places, and it was fun to have a family reunion. Well, one time, we came to a family reunion, and there was a new girl there, because my cousin said the doctor, she didn't have a mom and a dad, because they had both died, and she was living in Norfolk, and they adopted her and brought her to the family reunion, and it was very strange to watch her react. Because we all walked into the room full of food, and it was just a normal, everyday family reunion for us. Because we always had food, especially the pecan pies. So, we will talk about that too much because I'm still hungry. But we had been there, and it was amazing. But you know what she did? I think it was Anna. Anna was like, oh, wow. She couldn't believe how much food was there. And then we, we were getting hugged. In fact, Aunt Ruby didn't have any teeth. And she didn't buy any to put in. So she didn't have any teeth. And when she kissed you, it was kind of good. In a way. Yeah, I know exactly. That's why I said She thought it was fun, but it was scary. But anyway, uh, she would give you kisses. And then uh, we walked in, and we were getting hugs and kisses and hugs and kisses. And she walked in, and she was so surprised. She was like, hugs and kisses, hugs and kisses. She didn't know what to do with it. But she decided that she liked the food, and she liked the hugs and kisses. She was very surprised because now she had a family that she didn't have before. And the first day the disciples came to look at a tomb where Jesus died, they were very surprised. And they began to be surprised over and over again at how much God loved them. 
and how much being part of the Christian church was, was so exciting. And they would gather together. In fact, they had what was called agape. It's a fancy word. Agape meals in the early church. They would get together every Sunday and worship and feed. And the poor people that were part of the church that didn't have enough to eat would have their best meal of the week at church. I'm just glad that we get surprised sometimes. Sometimes the best things are surprises. And I hope we all wake up surprised every day about how much God loves us and how much we can love us. Let's ask God to help us. God, thank you so much for loving us. Sometimes we think we might not be loved or that you might be angry at us. We thank you that you always surprise us with love and grace and forgiveness. And you get to help us help us surprise each other with how much we can love us. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. That's the best part of today. We come now to a time where we want to look at our prayer list. And uh, if you would, you can prepare to give us any updates or additions to the prayer list. Uh, Donna Wall was wanting us to lift up Austin Carter, who's been on our prayer list before, but is having new issues, uh, including a brain surgery. So let's be lifting up Austin Carter. He's 23 years old, and that's tough to tough. But when you're 23, you're not, you don't have enough life wisdom to gain and take it all. But to be praying for all of you. I have a friend, Guy McCall. He's in the hospice in Greensboro. Uh, Guy is the father of a severely disabled son named Guy Jr. And he's been caring for his son. And his wife has disabilities. So they're not only going through the end of Guy's life as he's in hospice, but they're also having to make sure that he and his wife have ways to care for their disabled son. So if you would remember God in the hall. Are there other additions or updates? Anybody out on the street? Be praying for our team to shape in our future together in Christ's team. We'll be beginning to meet again this week after looking at our church history and begin looking at and inviting all of you to contribute to looking at where we are as a church and where we want to go. We look at history and tell us where we are and where we want to go. And I'm excited about what the Holy Spirit has for us. We pray uh, for our church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. We continue to remember the conflicts going on in our world and the things that are not only the people on our list, but the things on our hearts. Let you pray as the Spirit leads you. Lord, we're here on this Easter morning. We are a fellowship that actually celebrates the resurrection each time we gather on Sunday. Each time we move in our hearts to you in prayer. This is the annual celebration of that first day. It dawned upon people that the way things were and the way they were going, not what these last words said. You and your love would have a Thank you that we can come to our prayers, the burdens that are on the heart, our struggles, realize we're not alone, our struggles to forgive ourselves and others. Come and we're able to bring people to you who are facing the 
let them know they're not alone. We pray that you would work in ways that your Holy Spirit could work beyond what we can do and see and understand. Bringing people or realization of your presence and your love and your strength. We thank you that every time we think we're dead in the grave, you have another word for us. So in light of what we are here to celebrate, in light of the fact that your love wins, in light of the fact that you committed our life to that life, eternal life, we lift these prayers to you. Amen. In addition to every other way that the Lord might speak to you through the Holy Spirit as you take the bread and cup this morning, I encourage you not only to think about receiving this grace, but perhaps we could use our holy imagination to let the Holy Spirit take us back to that, that time when they were gathering and hearing news from those who had been to the tomb and found it empty. Could we be surprised again? Could we find out we weren't just going to a gathering of strangers, but we were gathering with family? Could it be that we are used to having less than we need, less love than we want, and finding out we have more love than we could ever imagine? Could we come to the table like those who were receiving the food and be open as they were to what that might mean? Because they became convinced they changed their life. They became convinced they were healed and strengthened. They became convinced they healed others. They became convinced that they were not stuck in all of the plots and toxicity of the Roman Empire. They were taken over by eternal life in the kingdom of God. And they brought it about on earth as it was in heaven. People could not deny, based on how they were living, that Jesus had indeed risen. Let's go to the table this day, ready to meet with the risen Christ. Through the bread, let's sing our hymn of communion. Come, you faithful, praying.
students how to run this platform. Like a quick reminder that you are all competing to be the new dark red fire. To celebrate this together, we need to ask for courage to go and make this leap. Keep Christ in this world. May we love others the way we love others. And may we evident to those around us the truth that Jesus is alive. He was betrayed, he took the bread and broke it. He said, This is my body broken for you. It's often this is the Lord's good and good. Let us pray. Lord, we will never pour out our hearts before you and we wonder and pray. We believe that your promise of new life has been fulfilled. In the symbol of this cup, we experience your grace bubbling up and overflowing on this dry ground of our poet's mind. Thank you for keeping covenant with us when it was not deserved. Thank you for sealing your new covenant with this cup, the symbol of Jesus' eternal blood, poured out for salvation and forgiveness. As we drink of it, may our lives and spirits be sufficient. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. We come now to acknowledge and to be grateful for the offerings that we gather here. Christ has come and shown us that God himself has given it all for us. It just also took time to be with his friends. We was the same as he worked the job before he was done. I tender it in the street. God understands that we support ourselves. And many things in our lives and community. One of the things that we do is we bring part of what we have, not as the full gift we give, because the full gift we give is ourselves. But we give a piece to gather, to, we gather together our resources and support this church and the life of the church around the world. And there's a special offering being taken uh, this time at Christmas, the uh, Easter offering, and part of that goes to relieve needs around the world. Some of those resources are going to address this crisis in Afghanistan, at the border, uh, immigrant crisis, and also with Ukraine. And so we, we will express gratitude to God for everything we have, offer God back all that is ours. And then we dedicate a portion to support the life of our church and work with Christ and his kingdom. To the glory of Christ. Amen. Let's sing our song. reading from 1 Corinthians 15 verses 15 through 50 and I'm reading from the Bible here in the future but I didn't put it that way that time. I got confused now. <laughs> that was today's English version. All right. May God add meaning to the reading of the word. What I mean brother is that what is made of flesh and blood cannot share in God's kingdom, and what is mortal cannot possess immortality. Listen to the secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, we shall all be changed in an instant, as quickly as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised, never to die again, and we shall all be changed. For what is mortal must be changed into what is immortal. What will die must be changed into what cannot die. So when this takes place, the mortal 
has been changed into the immortal, then the scripture will come true. Death is destroyed. Victory is complete. Where death is your victory? Where death is your power to hurt? Death gets its power to hurt from sin. Sin gets its power from the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, my dear brother, stand firm and steady. Keep busy always in your work for the Lord, since you know that nothing you do in the Lord's service is ever useless. The scripture that you read is at the end of 1 Corinthians. I want to remind you that 1 Corinthians' real crescendo happened in, in chapter 12 and 14. And the crescendo is love. In fact, Paul's words are very clear. If you do all kinds of miraculous things, if you give everything, including your body, to Christ, and die a martyr's death, and you don't have agape, you don't have that happening with inside the context of the love of God, then it's it's not, it's nothing, it's fruit. And what he's wanting us to understand is that if, if the perishable is going to put on imperishable, if mortality is going to put on immortality, it will not happen by us organizing things and, and just and trusting our good intentions. Have y'all ever had good intentions and it not turned out well? Have you ever had really good intentions and hurt someone's feelings? Have you ever had good intentions and realized you missed a whole lot of evidence that something else would have been a better choice? I think it's true. I think we know it. That our way is perishable. Our way is worse. Flesh and blood can't get it done unless it gets transformed, unless we are transformed. Well, what it, I just wanted to say that, uh, give us a break. Let's, let's be kind to all of us, okay? If, since we are perishable, since we are mortal, I think God understands that we get scared. I think God understands we have a lot of fear. In fact, I think we are built so that when we are feeling very afraid, we will fight what makes us afraid? We will flee from what makes us afraid? Or we will freeze in the midst of our fear? We'll be an ostrich or a possum. We'll do whatever it takes to avoid losing to what we fear. In whatever way you would perceive yourself as losing. Or giving up. Or suffering the damage from all that we fear. And if you're perishable, there are a lot of endings. When people die, it's goodbye forever. You lose things, and you can lose hope. Because perishable leads to fear, and that leads to a survival instinct, and that survival instinct ends up taking us as far as it can go, and we end up dying anyway. I frankly think it's a good thing to find an alternative to that. You know? There's a way in which the perishable puts on imperishable, mortal puts on immortality, I think there are several. But let's remember, when you are now putting on imperishable, the imperishable, when you're now immortal, then what you realize is that there's, there's perfect love that fills the universe and fills eternity. There's a perfect love that was at the beginning, creating everything, a perfect love sustaining everything and calling us to heal and grow, and a perfect love at the end that will have the last word. And perfect love casts out all one of the things we're trying to do is try that we are the objects of and the children of the people of perfect love so that we can be free of our fear i think we need to pay attention when we're afraid i think it's very helpful when i notice what i'm afraid of i can then decide who deals with this fear how will i think through and process what i'm afraid of and if I do that in the context of pure love, if I ask to be part of that love's expression, then every place on the other side is life. And then if you are 
imperishable, and if you put on immortality, then every ending is really just a transition. When my friend Guy McCall dies, in the next few hours or days, he will go through a transition. We have known others in our fellowship. You have had many in your lives who have gone through that transition. So let's think about it a little bit. I would like to propose that today we celebrate the Easter real, realization and that the Easter realization tells us the last word. Sometimes we try to cope using denial, minimizing, scapegoating, and historical fiction. Maybe y'all don't have as many of those uh, tendencies as I do. But one, one way we cope with our fears is just to deny it. No, no, not true. No, not going to happen. Couldn't happen. No, no, no way. My dad smoked three packs of cigarettes a day when he was, not, when he was in for his, after his bypass surgery, he was in for his bypass on his legs, all the reasons. Does this have anything to do with my smoking? The face that doctor made was, I wish I could have captured that. I got a million likes on some social media platform. He said, yes, sir, I'm sure it does. He said, really? Yes, sir. <laughs> now, my dad had some dementia at the time, so I think I might have been smarter than that without it. But we all try it. Perhaps, maybe you don't. But I have some time just to say, no, I didn't do that. I can remember catching my sons trying to swallow the cookie that I tell them, told them they stole, and they're like, nope. We also try minimize. We really do. It's, it's not as bad as you might think. It didn't hurt those people as bad as they say it did. It just wasn't that bad. Or, you know, I... I know I have a role in that. I know I'm part of this family. But really, I mean, I'm not that important. I mean, I don't have to be so responsible because I'm not, not that big of an influence. And then we have scapegoating. When we run into fear and guilt, we, we decide to put it on someone else. It's their fault. Um, scapegoating is when, one, there's, when there's one who bears the blame for others. And we have certainly, at least I do, once in a while, I just, I just know it's their fault. I'd be such a good husband to change the shape up. But you know that? Yeah, you never have that? There are plenty of pastors that think they'd be a good pastor if they had a good church. There are plenty of churches that think, well, we'd be a good church if we had a good pastor. Well, who is the scapegoat? Well, how's it going to be? Uh, we scapegoat. And then there's historical fiction. Frankly, that's my favorite. So I like telling stories, you know, and, and it, I just found out you can make yourself look different in the way you tell it than it really was. And it was really true. I really did play that football game. That was, you know, the way I told it, I might have been a little more uh, responsible for the victory than I actually was. But you can do historical fiction. And you can do historical fiction by putting yourself in a good light but I also want us to think and pray about those folks who do historical fiction and put shame on themselves and guilt on themselves. Not guilt. Historical fiction, denial, minimizing, scapegoating. We try those things, and one of the reasons we try them is we're so afraid. We're afraid of what might really happen and what, what, what it might cause to come to an end. I can't let her or him know what actually happened because they might not ever love me again. They might leave me. I can't let that really be true, or I'll have to come to the conclusion I'm a bad person. I know what happens to bad people. I can tell the story of what happens to bad people. But I just want to say for the record, we were built to try those things. We live lives that are confused and include bad things happening to us and doing bad things to others. And so I just don't want to... I don't want to blame myself or blame anyone for trying some denial or doing some minimizing or scapegoating or even writing a version of the story that they should have been. It's just fun to tell that way. Or even buying into the story that you may have been told by your abuser that makes you at fault. Historical fiction. 
Some people, when they look back on Jesus, they think it's historical fiction. It's a really cool story how this guy who loves everybody dies like like wimps like that guy, and then he's just dead. And, and you, when you tell us he rose from the dead, that's just historical fiction. Good story. I'm glad, glad it got told, but The next thing I have in the outline is that with Jesus Christ, we are invited to let all of life have its full say. The cross can take it all. I'd like us to take a big, deep breath. No matter how much denial and minimizing scapegoat and historical fiction we've been part of, I would just like to remind us, myself and all of us, that. God can handle the full truth of our world. God can handle the full truth of who you are and what you've done. The full truth of who you've been and what has happened to you. So, I would just say, hold on to denial as long as you need to. If that's the way you're going to protect yourself. But I would encourage us all, beginning with me, to try and work past the denial and open ourselves up to Truth because the full truth will set us free. The full truth will include that we're loved and forgiven. The full truth will include that we're loved and infused with the spirit so we can heal from the, from the abuse and the trauma of our lives. But I could see, see us saying, Will I still be loved if everyone finds out about this? Will I be blamed or rejected? Is it my fault that these bad things happen? And if we can just keep denying them, we never have to find out the answer. And so we, we freeze or we fight it. We run away. And I'd like to say, if you want to, try, try minimizing. I do it. But that's when you know you don't, have to be, you don't have to be afraid of the full truth of what you've done or what's been done to you. The full truth. When I sat with my therapist and pastoral counselor and support group, a group of pastors for two years, meeting every week with the group and once with the counselor, we knew. it took a long time for my counselor to help me understand that sometimes my dad's violence was not connected to my behavior. It was about his misery in his own soul. And that what he did at certain times was not good and healthy. I had to stop denying what my dad had done to me. And at the same time, it caused me to do things to others. Minimizing, denial, scapegoating, whose fault is it? And the answer to it all is that we don't have to scapegoat. We don't have to blame it on someone else. We can let them be who they are with their part of their responsibility and their role in everything. And we can take our own responsibility and our role in each thing. And we can get past historical fiction into the best of our ability, see the world as it really is, and the story of our lives the way the story really is. And if we stop connecting and protecting ourselves and hiding out in historical fiction, we could actually rewrite the true story of where this thing is going. Where is it going to go? Well, we can go from things just happen that way, and I know how this is going to turn out. It could turn out so differently. Things have actually changed, and we don't have to pretend the past. The next thing is that Easter is the announcement that as all is said and done, God will take it all and prove to be alive and loved. So here's the progression. You have the causes of what happened. What happened. The moment, this moment that we're having right now. If you were to look at it and you were to be given God's eyes and mind, you could actually put all the factors together in every one of our lives that brought us to sitting and me standing right here in this moment. And if we could know all of that, we would all look at each other and go, yep, that's the good place to fit in. Okay. 
could fit anywhere else based on the whole story. And there's no one to blame. And as you take the bread and the cup, what I want you to know is that right here, right now, all the complexities that have been going on in our life and brought us together at this moment, with it all said and done, there are the causes. And now the question comes, what's the cause of what happens next? What are the choices we've made that brought us to this moment? And what are the choices we're going to make in this moment that will create a different future moving forward? Our current reality then becomes the place where we face off with the crisis. And there is a crisis going on. There, you, you and I are deciding today, will all the stuff that's not right in our lives be perpetuated for another day, another week, another day? Or will we, in this moment, be freed from denial and minimizing scapegoating and historical fiction and come to see ourselves as God sees us and accept ourselves as God accepts us and receive from the Holy Spirit the power that God wants to give us? And in this crisis, the perishable story, the mortal story, no longer is out. We take it off and we put on the immortality and the imperishable. Well, that happens when Christ becomes Lord of the crisis. Christ has put him in the grave, and the question is, is that the end? Is that crisis turning out this way? Will it just be the end? That's the end of the story? Or will that crisis prove to be a beginning, a transition, a movement to a better and a beautiful future? I think Christ says there's grace for everything that needs grace that brought us to this moment, and there is strength and encouragement and and, and the coming alongside of the Holy Spirit with us in everything that's good that we bring to the moment and we can move forward. Maybe it's true for you. I know it's true for me. Sometimes I get stuck on Friday. I like get stuck on Friday where Jesus is dying on the cross and you're just deciding again, well, is he the Messiah or not? This isn't exactly like I thought it'd be. I'm not really sure if he's the Messiah. Hmm, he's dying. He's dead. He's in a grave. Not really sure. It might lead some who've been following him to deny him. So the story goes. It might lead some who were following him to just sneak off and kind of just watch from the periphery. Some people, and in fact, sometimes I get stuck on Friday. I'm not really sure I believe. And then, then I think, okay, I, I believe he was from Simon. And then I can, maybe you can, get stuck on Saturday. Oh, I believe that, that his version of love is the version of love I believe in. Yep, that's the one. I believe it, but I can't do it. There is no way I can live like Christ. He forgave everybody. Yep. He kept moving along and faced off with the powers, the powers and uh, the, the, the leaders of his his religion and his country. He he faced all my I just can't do that. I can't be that strong. I can't be that big. I just can't do it. And, and we get stuck on Saturday. I really like the version of love that Jesus had took him to the cross, but right now I just don't think I can do it. And maybe it's a little denial. If I face off of that, would I really forgive the person if I could if I actually admitted everything they've done? Would I be forgiven if I admitted everything I've done? If I stop scapegoating, can I handle my own guilt? If I took the fiction out of the story, I tell myself about who I am. Can I handle the true story? Not on Saturday. I ain't gonna handle it on Saturday. And it's up to you to do it. I just want you to know, living up to God's uh, best without Sunday, without Easter, is exhausting and impossible. We're getting you ready. Flesh and blood just came. What happens when Sunday comes? What happens with East and the other side of East? Well, what you have to remember is this is a big deal. So when they tell the disciples, y'all remember what happened? They tell the disciples, and the disciples were like, I knew it. I knew it all along. 
That's the way it was good to be. Never down there for a minute, you know. Then they came back and were told, and some doubted. After seeing the risen Christ, some doubted. What? Doubted? This is a big deal, yo. This is not saying you thought you had four biscuits in the bag and they messed up and gave you six. That's pretty cool. You got two extra biscuits. This is a pretty good day. That's, it's not that kind of you got to believe it. Because you looked at it, you got six biscuits. I paid for four. This is pretty cool. This is, you thought the world worked this way. And if you buy into this version of historical reality, it can go this way. Totally. I'm here to tell you that a young kid who became a man who sat in a support group and admitted the damage done by his dad also was helped to remember all the good that his dad gave him. And his dad and his son had a wonderful many years. When I finally had the guts to say, this happened and this is how I experienced it. And he had the grace to say, I'm sorry. Everything changed. If I hadn't done the Jesus approach to my daddy, and if my daddy hadn't received the stories with Jesus helping him, it would not have happened. I would have continued to be afraid of my daddy, and I would have been tense every time around it. And I'm not saying or can't listen to this story. That I didn't get here, that he didn't manipulate me for the better. I'm just saying, there were these beautiful moments. Because Jesus didn't leave him like he was, and me like I was, and with us together when we were together. And I say thank you to God. So, will we put on imperishable and live in the joy of the victory over sin and grave? Will we? Put on immortality and live in the joy of victory over sin and the grave. The way it's said in the NIV, in the passage that Virginia read, is always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that you labor not in vain. You know you don't, you're not laboring in vain. <laughs> now it's interesting, you hear me say all the time that there's a word in Greek that's rudest gnosis. And it's about experiential knowledge. Right? It's like when my dad, my dad was saying, now the way the lawnmower works is, buddy, you spin that, there's these magnets inside, and they spin around the magnet, they create an electrical current, and they go to the spark plug, and it ignites, it ignites the gas at the end of the spark plug. I'm like, really? Is that the way it is? He said, yeah, just grab that spark plug there for a second. And I grabbed it, and he pulled it, and I'm, wow! And I said, he said, that's, that's the kind of power it takes. So, explode some gas and move it out. And yeah, I just want you to know, I know what that spark plug goes through. You understand? Spark plug's made, to, made for the current to go through it. People are not. So don't do what I just said. But now the question comes, do you have to, do, I'm going to ask you a real question. Do you have to grab the spark plug to believe? Because there's this other kind of note, which is in the passage. And the, Virginia, and the passage she read is, oh, I see that. Oh, I get it. Now I understand. And you don't have to grab the spark. Do you understand? Well, when you get changed, you meet Christ and you have an experience. You have a real experience of Jesus Christ. And you hear others telling you about the experience. Then you come to a place where you might sing out loud. I once was blind, but now I see. Oh, I see. I see how well, this works. Why do you give yourself solely to the work of the Lord? Because you've read the stories that turned out not to be historical fiction. You've experienced it in your life and in the lives of others. And everyone's telling our stories to each other. And we look at one another and we go, now I know what you're talking about. Now I know. And since I know I'm going to give myself fully to that, I will give myself fully to that that I now see. I'm glad love, love is given, that God has given the last word. 
Because there's all of those words that are said between the beginning and the end. We live in a world that's waiting for us to demonstrate the resurrection. Waiting for us to do that. But I would like to invite us to come back even before that calling. And I would like us all to just breathe deep and remember that we are the ones who are given the gift. And until we had that gnosis experience, experience for ourselves, and until it dawns on us to see with our spiritual eyes, we're not going to give ourselves completely. So look, listen. Let the Spirit of God speak to you. I believe that our world needs healing. In our relationships, I believe our earth needs healing. I believe there are ways in which we can see and know and orient our lives differently so that more of our neighbors have more of what they need so that the earth can heal so that we can be more of what Jesus called the kingdom of God. May it be so. Let us pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you that as dawn was happening earlier today, we were able to be together with some of our neighbors and celebrate the resurrection and listen to the songs of the birds. And thank you that we've been able to gather in this time and sing our songs ourselves and being together in prayer and in communion. I pray that right now each of us would receive the truth of your love and of your resurrection power, of your willingness and ability to heal us, to heal our relationships, to help us see the way to move forward towards a different future. So Lord, as long as we need to, we'll hide in our denial, but keep telling us that the truth will set us free. As long as we have to, we'll minimize what we did or what was done to us, but help us to remember that Jesus hanging on the cross took everything we could do that's harmful and everything harmful that can be done to us and said that's not the last word. So we can be honest about our hurts and the hurt we cause and receive your love and grace. Lord, help us as long as we need to, we'll blame others. But help us to own personal responsibility and realize that we do that inside through grace. To help us to get past having to shape historical fiction as we tell the story of our lives and our own mind others and help us to experience your love and grace and tell the true story of our, of our lives so that our story leading up to today would be a story brought to this day in a confrontation and crisis with you and that our story moving forward will include how your love and grace has transformed us and through us transform the world we pray this Easter prayer in the name of the risen Christ Amen
place one hand on your heart and be reminded that you are the place where Christ dwells. That you are not only the tomb that held him as your grace is grace for you is confirmed, but you are the one who is given the spirit to now go and offer your hand to the Now go and be the resurrected Christ of the Lord to the world. Be the light in the leaven that helps them to know that they're loved and forgiven to the glory of Christ. Amen. Love you guys.